Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence this evening. So very grateful for the opportunity that you give us to come together to feast upon your word. We just give you all the glory and the honor and the praise. Filter out that which is foolish, seal to our hearts, only that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. In our Wednesday night uh, services or studies or videos, however you want to put that, uh, we've been looking at various other topics. Uh, we're studying 2 Corinthians on Sunday. Uh, we're just moving into chapter 2 there. I invite you to join us on Sunday for those uh, videos. Uh, we hope to uh, uh, continue on with our study in 2 Corinthians. In the meantime, we're looking at various topics on, on Wednesday. And so I decided that I would like to talk to you folks about the sovereign omnipotence of God. You know, despite what the uh, most of the, the dishonest world suggests, God exists, and since God has a relationship with His people, He's established a, uh, God has established a media of communication between Himself and His people, and that media is not wisdom uh, of man's wisdom. It's not uh, visions, dreams, wild thoughts, or imaginations, but it is in fact His Word, something that we put a, a great emphasis on here uh, on this channel. And we know that He reveals Himself as a triune God, uh, as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and He does that because His revelation is the revelation of redemption. And so we're going to uh, we're going to look at His omnipotence, uh, which I believe is, is uh, well, I, I think it's an enormously interesting topic. I believe this to be a very important area in the Word of God. Uh, many years ago, there was a man named uh, Tetza uh, who worked out a deal with a pope that, that he could sell you certain indulgences. Uh, if you had a profound desire to kill your mother-in-law for a certain price, you could buy an indulgence and that sin would be put away and you wouldn't go to purgatory for that. And, uh, and that's not a joke. That was included in the list of sins that could be covered. Of course, the price of the indulgence went up and it was a neat way for the church to raise capital. And there was an individual, as you know, many of you know, Martin Luther, who argued with that, saying, well, that, that's not such a good thing uh, for the church to do. And so he goes to Rome to argue with the Pope, and, and uh, history states that uh, uh, the, the, the verse justified, uh, justified by faith struck him, and it changed his life. And so he nails a piece of paper to the Wittenberg Cathedral containing the 95 revolutionary opinions that would begin the Protestant Reformation. The point I'm trying to make is that for the majority of people uh, who claim to be God's people in that day and age, to, to suggest that there was something wrong with those indulgences meant a death sentence. If they could get a hold of you, uh, you know, you just didn't question the tradition of the church. Now, there are many traditions in modern Christianity that are just as dangerous as those indulgences, and to suggest that, they're, uh, uh, that they are dangerous and that they're not biblical is to, is to bring down the wrath of the modern Christian movement. You know, for example, uh, asking you to make a decision for Christ is not biblical. And yet numerous people, more than I could possibly name, uh, you know, they won't listen to this ministry because I don't give an invitation. Uh, most ministers that I've known have said that they learned early on in their ministry that they'd never let one single oppor opportunity pass them by without giving somebody the opportunity to accept Christ. Now, that's as 
tra that's as traditional as the indulgences. Uh, it's not out of the Bible. It's out of man's reasoning and, and philosophies that are contrary to the Scriptures. And one of the great arguments today is against the supreme sovereignty of God. My concern is that I'm a poor voice for this. I believe it's a subject that needs a much better teacher than what I am. Uh, I'm not only humbled, but I'm stunned as I try to think how I would present any decent discussion of the sovereign omnipotence of God. And so I want to begin this uh, discussion this evening by reading the 104th Psalm, and I'd appreciate it if you'd turn there uh, with me. Beginning at verse 1, Bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord my God, Thou art very great, Thou art clothed with honor and majesty. Thou art very great. Uh, I don't see hardly how that the man can uh, possibly uh, des describe that greatness. Uh, and so it's, uh, even as God wrote it, it's just, thou art very great. Uh, you know, it's, it's, there's not much more that you could, you know, build on that. It's, it's, he's so great, in fact, that we can't hardly just say that he's great without, without, uh, it's, it just seems to fall so short of just how great he really is. Verse 2, who covers thyself with light as with a garment, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain, who lays the beams of his chambers in the waters, who maketh the clouds his chariot, who walketh upon the wings of the wind, who makes his angels spirits, his ministers a flaming fire, who laid the foundations of the earth that it should not be removed forever. Thou coveredst it with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. At thy rebuke they fled. At the voice of thy thunder they hasted away. They go up by the mountains. They go down by the valleys unto the place which thou hast founded for them, thou hast set a bound that they may not pass over, that they turn not again to cover the earth. He sends the springs into the valleys which run, run among the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. Uh, the wild uh, donkeys, they quench their thirst, and by them shall the fowls of the heaven have their habitation, which sing among the branches. He waters the hills from his chambers. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of thy works. He causes the grass to grow for the cattle and herb for the service of man that he may bring forth food out of the earth and wine that makes glad the heart of man and oil to make his face to shine and bread which strengthens man's heart. The trees of the Lord are full of sap, the cedars of Lebanon which he has planted where the birds make their nests. As for the stork, uh, the fir trees are her house. The high hills are a refuge for the wild goats and the rocks for the conies. He appointed the moon for seasons. The sun knoweth his going down. Thou makest darkness in its night, wherein all the beasts of the forest do creep forth. The young lions roar after their prey and seek their meat from God. The sun arises. They gather themselves together and lay them down in their dens. Man goeth forth unto his work and to his labor unto, until the evening. O Lord, how manifold are thy works. In wisdom hast thou made them all. The earth is full of thy riches, so is this great and wide sea, wherein are, are, are things creeping, innumerable, both small and great beasts. There go the ships, there is that Leviathan whom thou hast made to play therein. These wait all upon thee, that thou mayest give them their meat in due season, that thou givest them, they gather, thou openest thine hand, they are filled with good, thou hidest thy face, they are troubled. Thou takest away their breath, they die and return to their dust. Thou sendest forth thy spirit, they are created, and thou renewest the face of the earth. The glory of the Lord shall endure forever. The Lord shall rejoice in his works. He looks on the earth and it trembles. He touches the hills and they smoke. I will sing unto the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. My meditation of him shall be sweet. I will be glad in the Lord. Let the sinners be consumed out of the earth, and let the wicked be no more. Bless thou the Lord, O my soul. Praise ye the Lord. That's only one uh, passage of Scripture that deals with the sovereignty of God. 
I'm going to suggest that sovereignty says that God has absolute power and dominion over all of his creation and all of his creatures. He can dispose of them as he wills, uh, as he determines. Uh, uh, he, he, he dis just as he pleases, uh, that is God's sovereignty. Now, you don't go to a concordance and you don't look up the word sovereignty and say, boy, there aren't very many passages of Scripture on God's sovereignty. What we have is a revelation of the sovereignty of God on virtually every page of Scripture. Uh, think of God at creation. He, he says, let there be light. And what happened? There's light. I believe these are simple facts given to reasoning creatures that reveal the absolute sovereignty of God over all of His creation and over all of His creatures. He spoke and the waters above were divided from the waters below. He, he spoke but just a word and the fish appeared, the birds appeared, the stars of the heavens appeared. Uh, he, he just spoke. There, there wasn't any using up of His power, but no strain on His energy. Uh, he just spoke and it happened. The Word of God reveals very clearly that He is sovereign over that which is without life. Uh, the windows of heaven were opened and the floods came. The, the fountains of the deep opened up and the water swelled over the earth so that the highest hill was covered. The Red Sea divided on both sides. Uh, the water standing up in a heap so that His people could go through on dry land. Uh, the waters not only divided and stood up, the ground was dry. The sun stood still. The sun moved back on the sundial at His command, and His own people were placed in the fiery furnace, and they weren't touched by the flames. The winds and the, 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 the waves obeyed Him, uh, as did you and I. He just spoke, and it was done. He's absolutely sovereign over all of His creation. He's also sovereign over that which has life, he told Noah to put every animal in the ark two by two, and all of your pictures uh, you know, that you see are wrong. It wasn't one male and one female, it was two males and two females. They went in by pairs. I believe that by the breath of God, those animals stood up in turn and got on that ark. You know, it wasn't like, you know, hey Ham, you're the uh, best wrangler we got, go fetch all them critters. In the plagues of Egypt, the frogs came uh, when he told them to come. Uh, I've never had any, any luck getting a frog to do anything. They went when he told them to go. The water turned from water to blood at his command, and it, and it turned back at his command. The flies and the lice pestered the people at his command, and they fled away at his command. He used the mouth of a donkey to speak to Balaam. He, he uses my mouth to speak to you. Uh, the lion in the den never touched Daniel. And if you think the lion wasn't hungry, uh, just remember that when Daniel's accusers were thrown in, they were torn to pieces and they were devoured by those same lions. Jonah was swallowed by a whale or something like a whale. It did exactly what God told it to do. Jonah was preserved in a situation that has amazed mankind for years. Most don't really believe that it happened. Uh, quite a small feat for God to preserve a man in the belly of a fish when he, when he, pre he, pre he preserves the souls of his saints. The Lord told Peter to go catch a fish and take the coin out of his mouth. Uh, if Peter hadn't caught the fish, he would have jumped out of the water into the boat. They all moved at the Lord's command. This is how powerful a God that we serve. We have the testimony of experts who study evidence and reasoning. We rely on the testimony of experts. We want the best doctor we can get. We want the best dentist that we can get. We want the best mechanic that we can get. And I, and I think God has given us a, a, a myriad of experts. For example, Abraham, uh, who gave the first fruits of his flock to God? Well, who told him to do that? And why did he do it? 
Abraham leaves his home not knowing where he's going. Why did he do that? Because God is sovereign. He, Abraham was willing to offer his son Isaac. Well, wait a minute. I can't offer Isaac. I'm too old to have any more kids. I, I get one child and now many years later, you're asking me to sacrifice that child. Where are my heirs? You know, how, how can it be possible that my descendants are numbered greater than the sands of the sea or the stars in the heavens if I sacrifice Isaac? God knows what He's doing. God told him to sacrifice Isaac and he set about to do it. We have Job who, going through some very serious difficulties in his life, he decided he'd, uh, he'd like to question God and when the opportunity came, he was speechless. And his testimony is that if he questions me, I have no answer. In another uh, unforgettable story in Daniel, uh, Nebuchadnezzar is punished for his pride and he wanders the wilderness like a beast eating grass for seven years. He was driven away from the people and he ate grass like an ox. He looked out over the vastness of, a ki of his kingdom. Is, is, is this not great Babylon which I built? And at the snap of God's fingers, he was like the beast of the field eating grass. As far as man is concerned, he was insane. Now, don't miss this testimony. You know, would you have ever had that man back as king? Probably not. But he was. God raised him up. He, he got his throne back. And then he testified at the end of his days. Uh, if we look at Daniel 4, and at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me, and that's, that's the reasoning capability that I'm talking about. And I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored Him that liveth forever. He did not say, God, I think it's awful that you made me like the beast of the field to eat grass in, in the eyes of all of my countrymen. That, you know, basically caused me to go Looney Tunes. He didn't charge God with any of that. I praised and honored Him that lives forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and His kingdom is from generation to generation, and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and He does according to His will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay His hand or say unto Him, you know, what in the world are you doing? Folks, I'm suggesting that we have by the love of God and the Holy Spirit's interest in us. We have experts who have testified to the sovereignty of God. The Word of God speaks of His sovereignty in the heavenly hosts, uh, those who are good and those who are bad. There are those whom He sovereignly set up to be holy angels. There are His messengers. There are His reapers. There are His executioners of His judgments. Uh, they're there at His call. Uh, when he died on the cross, uh, Christ said if, if he wanted to, he could call 12 legions of angels who were at his command. And then there are the fallen angels, whom I believe were also there by God's design. The sons of God came to present themselves before God, and so, and so came Satan. Have you considered my servant Job? You know, great guy. And Satan says, you built a hedge about him. I can't touch him. His power is immense, but before God, he trembled in shame. I can't do anything, but God set the limits on what he could do. When we look at the demons who possessed the maniac of, of Gadara, when he expelled them from that maniac, they didn't have permission to go into the swine. They had to ask Jesus for permission. What they had anticipated is that he would send them back to the pit uh, if they were going to go into the swine, they had to ask him, ask his permission. The great emphasis, the reason that that's in the Word of God is, uh, I believe, to point out to you and to me that even the hosts of evil are subject to our God. They had to ask permission from him before they could go into the swine. And we could spend lots of time on these passages of Scripture. 
You know, Romans 9, God says unto Pharaoh, even for the same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. I'm, I'm fairly certain that Pharaoh wouldn't have agreed with that. God Almighty, incarnate in human flesh, stood before Pilate, and Pilate was exasperated because he couldn't get much out of him. And finally, uh, Pilate, I believe in desperation, said, don't you, know, don't you know that I, Pilate, have the power to crucify you or to set you free? And you'd think that by any stretch of the imagination that one would, would then tremble before him, longing to be set free, and God Almighty declared you would have no power at all unless it had been given to you from above. Uh, no power to convict, uh, no power to set free. I don't believe in the immediate context you can force me to say that that power only has to do with our Lord Jesus Christ. I believe the verse is much more encompassing. He was in his position of authority because God put him there. He had what he had because God gave it to him. He had the wife that he had because God gave him that wife. He had the position as 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 uh, Pilate, his position was God established. He didn't have anything that hadn't been given to him from above. God called Moses uh, to be the one to carry the message of deliverance to those in Egypt. And Moses was uh, pretty certain that he wasn't the one. You know, first of all, he didn't want to work that hard. He, he's an old man ready to retire. Uh, I kind of know how he feels. And secondly, he was sure he couldn't speak. And I certainly know how he feels there. There's no way I can do justice to such uh, an immense and holy subject. Exodus chapter 4, uh, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now therefore go and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. When Moses complained about his mouth and his inability to speak, he was complaining about the sovereign God who had made Moses exactly as he wanted him, exactly as he wanted him. The lesson for us is, is not to, to laugh at Moses for his objections to God, but to realize that it's true in our lives too. From your fingernails to your toenails, you are what God made. And we rejoice in the fact that, is, that this sovereign God is our God. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, the Lord says to His people, uh, See now that I, I, even I, am He, and there is no God but Me. I kill, I make alive, I wound, and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of My hand. And folks, that is true in your life and in mine. If you're wounded, God wounded you. If you're healed, God... God healed you. That's our sovereign God. He's the one that gives life. He's the one that takes life. I'm absolutely persuaded that you are immortal until God calls you home. I believe that from the bottom of my heart. In all truth, we're immortal now. We have eternal life now. Uh, we'll never die. God declared to His people that I'll be gracious to whom I'll be gracious. I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy. It's not of him that wills, nor of him that runs, but of God that shows mercy. You know, we could phrase that differently. It is not of him that tries or of him that makes decisions, but of God that shows mercy. You don't make a decision for Christ. Uh, Christ makes a decision for you. In Isaiah 46, the Lord says, Remember the former things of old, for I am, I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. In Isaiah 55, uh, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. In reading about the Tower of Babel, uh, he took the designs of men and he turned it into the confusion of tongues so that he might call out a people after his name. 
Jacob and his mother conspired to deceive his father so that the blessing of the firstborn might be given to him rather than, th rather than to his brother Isaac. Uh, but they didn't fool God. Those plans made by men were plans that God had laid out to accomplish his own purpose. Uh, uh, Laban, Laban uh, the brother of uh, Rebekah, who married Isaac and bore Jacob, had Jacob as virtual slave labor. Uh, you don't have to read the scriptures very carefully to realize that Laban's uh, plan was to strip Jacob of all his wealth, and God turned it around so that, in fact, Jacob stripped Laban of all of his wealth, and, and uh, Joseph was the favorite of his father. Jacob and his brothers knew that, and they laid very careful plans to make sure that uh, that brother of whom they were so jealous would, wouldn't in any way undermine the possibility of their inheritance. And so they put him down in a dry pit. They argued about killing him, and that's what they were going to do, but they figured that they could make a few bucks by selling, selling him into slavery and shipping him off to Egypt. And so they went back and told their father that he had been killed, and they showed him the bloody garment. And when they finally stood trembling before Joseph in Egypt, Joseph's words were God's words. Uh, you thought it for evil, but God meant it for good. Those conspiring brothers were wrong. Their, their thoughts were wrong. Their lusts were wrong. Their purposes were wrong. Uh, they were God's purposes for God's plan. Pharaoh, he decided he, he could oppress Israel so that there wouldn't be any threat of Israel taking over the land of Egypt. And the scriptures declare that the more he oppressed them, uh, the more they prospered. Gideon had an army of 32,000, and, and the chances of winning are slim, but at least he had 32,000 willing to fight. And God said, Gideon, how are you doing? Uh, not too well. I've got 32,000 people here, and, and with your help, we'll make it. And God said, uh, tell them to go down to the creek and get a drink and see whether they scoop it up with their hand or lick it like a dog. And uh, I don't know why he wants me to do that, but okay, and, and 300 of them. 300 out of 32,000. God said, these are the ones. Go fight with them now. Don't give them any weapons. Just give them torches, and, uh, but no swords and spears, and then we'll go fight the enemy. An overwhelming enemy. The, the testimony of Jonathan to his armor bearer is, was, is there any difficulty in God delivering with few or with many? And Jonathan and, and his armor bearer attacked the armies of the Philistines. And as Hudson Taylor said, the iron did swim, the sun stood still. This God is our God. So what does all of this mean in your life and mine? How are we to interpret all of this in light of our own present cir uh, circumstances, our own present situation? The word omnipotent, folks, comes from omni, meaning all, and potent, meaning power. He has all power over all things, at all times, and in all ways. Uh, Job spoke of that power in, in the 42nd chapter of Job. I know that you can do all things and that no plan of yours can be thwarted. Moses was reminded by God that he had all power to complete his purposes regarding the Israelites. Uh, the Lord answered Moses and said, and I think it's kind of funny, it's a little humor. I think God has a sense of humor. Uh, he says, well, is the Lord's arm too short? You will now see whether or not what I say will come true for you. That's in Numbers chapter 11. And nowhere is God's omnipotence seen more clearly than in creation. God said, let there be, and it, and, and, and it was so. And you and I are new creations in Christ Jesus. God simply spoke, and by the power of His Word, everything was created from nothing. By the Word of the Lord were the heavens made, their starry host by the breath of His mouth. God's power is also seen in the preservation of His creation. All life on earth would perish if it was not for God's continual provision of everything that we need. 
the seas which cover most of the planet and, and over which we are basically powerless would overwhelm us if God didn't prescribe their limits, as it says in Job chapter 38. We see that God's omnipotence extends to governments and leaders. Uh, we, we know that from Daniel chapter 2 as he restrains them or he lets them go their way according to his plans and his purposes. Uh, so there's your politics on this channel. Uh, being omnipotent, God can do everything that's in harmony with his holy character. The Bible reveals he can't do things which are contrary to his holy character. Uh, for example, in Numbers chapter 23, Titus 1, Hebrews 6, all, all, all of that teaches us that he cannot lie. God lacks the ability to lie. Uh, in the same way, despite his being all-powerful and hating evil, he allows evil to happen according to his good purpose. He uses certain evil events to allow his purposes to unfold such as when the greatest evil of, ever, of all time occurred, which was the killing of the innocent Lamb of God for our redemption. His power is seen in the miracles that He performed. Uh, numerous healings, the feeding of the 5,000, the calming the storm, the, uh, and the ultimate display of power, which is raising Lazarus and Jairus' daughter from the dead an example of His control over life and death. The Lord Jesus stated clearly that He had power to lay down His life and power to take it up again. The amazing thing to me is that this power can be shared by believers who are united to God and, and to one another in Christ. Paul says, Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. God's power is exalted in us most when our weaknesses are greatest because He's able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to His power that is at work within us. Ephesians chapter 3. It's God's power that continues to hold us in a state of grace despite our sin. 2 Timothy 1. And by His power we are kept from falling, Jude 24. His power will be proclaimed by all the hosts of heaven for all eternity, Revelation 19. So what does all of this mean in your life and mine? I don't care, folks, if it looks to you like I have the mark of Cain. Okay? If Jesus Christ died in my place, I cannot die. And because He was faithful in redeeming me. I figure uh, an all-powerful God who had the almighty power to translate me from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of His beloved Son can be trusted. He can be trusted concerning everything else. The winds and the sea obeyed Him, folks, and so did you. And so did I. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying, the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brother. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again not of corruptible seed, not of the flesh, not the will of man, but of incorruptible by the Word of God which lives and abides forever for all flesh is as grass and the glory, all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falleth away, but the Word of the Lord the Word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the Word which by the Gospel is preached unto you. 1 Peter chapter 1. I love you all. I truly do. Rest in His goodness, His greatness, His sovereignty, His love. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.